Statistics is the study of the collection, analysis, interpretation, and organization of data. And data is a set of values of quantitative or qualitative variables. But for purposes of what we will be doing here, let's just think of data as a set of numerical information. We'll begin this by looking at ways to organize data. And here's an example. Suppose 25 viewers evaluated the latest episode of CSI. And the possible evaluations they could give are E for excellent, A for above average, V for average, B for below average, and P for poor. After the show, the 25 evaluations were as follows. So there are 25, one for each person. Oftentimes, information that we need to analyze is not easy to deal with in its raw form, as you can see here. One way to organize discrete data into a more useful format is a frequency table. And let's construct one here. A frequency table just organizes the data by counting the number of occurrences. Those are the frequencies of each possible outcome. So for example, if you look at the E's and count them, there are four. So it has a frequency of four. If you count the A's, you'll find there are seven, meaning that the frequency of A is seven. There are eight V's, four B's, and two P's. If you add up all those numbers, you'll see there are 25. It corresponds to the number of viewers who evaluated. Now what if we take this frequency table and replace the counts with the probabilities of each of those occurring. Since there are 25 evaluations, the probability of a random evaluation being an E is simply 4 out of 25. The probability of a random evaluation being an A is 7 out of 25. The probability of a random evaluation being a V is 8 out of 25. For B, that's 4 out of 25. And for P, it's 2 out of 25. And if you'll add those numbers up, you'll find out you get 25 out of 25, which is 1. And that has to be the case. So the sum of those probabilities will always be 1. And if you're using decimals, we'll say that it has to be 1 within rounding error. So if you're rounding some decimal values, you might get slightly off, but it would be 1 within rounding error. Oftentimes you'll find the probability column will be labeled relative frequency. So whether you see probability or relative frequency, it's the same thing. The original table would be called a frequency table, and the table with the probabilities would be called the relative frequency table. Sometimes there's so many different outcomes that a frequency or relative frequency table is not very useful if you don't group the data. So lots of times you'll see that data is grouped. If I take this example of 20 healthcare workers and their scores on an assessment test, there are 20 of them. It would be very difficult to make much out of a frequency table or a relative frequency table that had 20 rows. So what you might do instead is just group them into intervals. I know that there's nothing below 50 in that table, so I might go from 50 to 54 and go up by fours until I've covered everything. If I start with a grouping of 50 to 54, I simply count how many outcomes, how many assessment scores in this case, lie in the interval from 50 to 54. And if you look, there are only two. The next interval will be 55 to 59, if I'm going by fours. And you'll see that there are four of those. Then I move to the next interval, 60 to 64. Notice there are six of those. The next interval will be 65 to 69. There are eight of those. And finally, I can add them up and make sure that I have all 20. So we've taken the raw data, instead of making a frequency table with every individual value, we've grouped them so that we can deal with a much larger set of data without having to uh, compromise. We can, so we're able to deal with a lot of raw data in a form that's more manageable. And if you wanted to turn that into a relative frequency table, all you do is divide each frequency by this total, which is 20, and you get the probabilities 
And if you put those in, you would have a relative frequency table. So if I divide 2 by 20, 4 by 20, 6 by 20, 8 by 20, and of course if you're going to leave them as fractions, you need to make sure they're completely reduced, and that would be the relative frequency table. And if you prefer, you can turn either a frequency table or a relative frequency table into a bar graph. So a little more visual. So if I take the earlier frequency table that we constructed and turn it into a bar graph, here's what I would do. I put the frequencies on the vertical axis. I would put the evaluations, these are the viewer evaluations from our earlier example, on the horizontal axis. And finally, I'd let the height of each bar represent the corresponding frequency. E has a frequency of 4, so the bar height for E would be 4. A has a frequency of 7, so its bar height would be 7. V has a frequency of 8, so its bar height would be 8. B has a frequency of 4, so its bar height would be 4. And finally, P has a frequency of 2, so its bar height would be 2. And now you've taken a frequency table and turned it into a bar graph. It gives us the same information, just another way of looking at it. If the data from a frequency or relative frequency table is continuous rather than discrete, we construct the bars with no space between them and we call the resulting graph a histogram instead of a bar graph. So it's the same idea, you're just shoving the bars together to make a distinction between discrete data and continuous data. We're not going to make much of the difference between discrete data and continuous data. It can be very important in certain cases, but we're not worried too much about it here. I'll just say this, if you think of discrete values as values that are completely distinct from each other, and continuous values as values that can sort of bleed over into each other, then you'll be okay for anything that we will be doing. Just a little quick example. Suppose you're counting things. Those counts are distinct. There's no doubt that 2 is different than 3. If you count 2 and you count 3, that's distinct. There's absolutely no doubt that those are different counts. On the other hand, if you're interested in measuring a person's height, one person might measure and get 59.99 inches. Another person might measure that same person and get 60.01 inches. And that's the sense that I'm talking about when I say the values sort of bleed into each other. There's not necessarily a right measurement. They're both attempting to measure the same thing. Those are continuous. And if you can handle that sort of level of understanding between discrete and continuous, you will be okay for anything that we will do with it here. Let's construct a histogram from the frequency table given here. Notice these are groupings. We're measuring pounds lost. One interval is 0 to 10, then it's more than 10 to 20, then more than 20 to 30, and then more than 30 to 40. It turns out that the frequencies are 14, 23, 17, and 11, respectively, and there are a total of 65 of them. If I wanted to make a histogram out of that, I would do the same thing I did when I did a bar graph. I would take the frequencies and put them on the vertical axis, and I would take the intervals for the pound lost and put them on the horizontal axis, and then I would make my bar heights correspond to each frequency. So it's 14, 23, 17, and 11. Notice that's exactly what we did with the bar graph. The only difference is that these are continuous and we make the bars with no space between the bars but as far as how you construct them, same thing. A stem and leaf plot is another visual way to display data. If you construct a stem and leaf plot, or a stem and leaf display, you're going to view every number as having two parts. The left digit is considered to be the stem, and the right digit is considered to be the leaf. And the best way to talk about this and show you what I mean is just to do an example. These are the number of home runs hit by the home run champions in the National League for the years 1975 to 1989 and for the years 1993 to 2007. So the first row contains the number of home runs hit from 1975 to 1989 and the second row does the same thing for the years 1993 to 2007. 
It says compare these home run records using a stem and leaf display. Here's all you do. You think of the left digit, I turned it blue here. You think of the left digit as the stem and the right digit is the leaf. So let's first look just at the 1975 through the 1989s. If you're looking through there at the stems, you'll notice the stems are only threes, fours, or fives. The right digits are considered the leaf, so you want to write them down in numerical order. So for example, if I'm looking at the leaves I wrote down, these two eights are both associated with the stem three, so they show up right here. And the reason that they aren't at the beginning is that I want them to be in numerical order. So if I'm looking through the other threes, there's a three one, I want it to come before the three eight. There's a three seven, in fact there's more than one, there's another three seven and another three seven, so all three of those sevens are associated with the stem three, but I'm just putting them in numerical order, and the only two that I haven't considered are the three six, that's this one, and the three nine, that's this one. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are eight leaves corresponding to the eight numbers that begin with a three. And you want to do the same thing for the fours. I won't go through every one of them, but you'll find out that there are two forties. There's a 47, there's two 48s, and there's a 49. And then you move to the five, and you'll find there's only one of those, and it's a 52. So the stems are the leftmost digits, the leaves are the rightmost digits. And if you want to put them back and reconstruct the number, you take the stem and the leaf, and if you shove them back together, you get the number. That's all there is to it. So we've done it now for 1975 through 1998 data. Let's do the same thing for the 1993 through 2007 data. I notice here that I have stems 4, 7, 6, 5. So it looks like the stems are either 4, 5, 6, or 7. And then I put the leaves together exactly the same as I did before. I go through and find all of the ones that begin with a 4. So there's a 40, a 43, a 46, two 47s, a 48, and two 49s. Then I move down and do the 5s. There's a 50, there's another 50 actually, there's a 51 and 58, then there's a 65, then there's a 70 and a 73. You're putting them in numerical order. So now we have the stem and leaf plot for the first set of data from 1975 to 1989, and we have the stem and leaf plot for the 1993-2007 data. It is possible to put them together in something that's called a back-to-back -back stem and leaf plot. If you want to do that, you take the stems and merge them together and put them in the middle. So you notice there's a three, so a three shows up. There's a four, so a four shows up. There's a five, so a five shows up. We've already considered four and five, but there's a six, so a six has to be put in, and there's a seven, so you get every possible stem from either side, put that in the middle, and then you take your data. The stem and leaf plot that was on the left will have leaves that sit on the left side, so there you go. There's, this, there's the first one, and then the second one goes there, and the third one goes there. And you notice you move, when you're going to the left, the smaller number is here and it gets larger as it goes to the right. So smaller to larger as it moves that way. And then when you do this one, it's the same idea, but they get smaller and larger in that direction. And each one of them is picked up and put there. In any case, this is called, this entire structure here, is called a side-by-side -side stem and leaf plot. So to wrap things up, I just want to summarize these different ways we talked about to organize and display data. We began by talking about the frequency table and how the same data can easily be described by a bar graph. We talked about relative frequency tables 
and how that can be turned into a histogram. And then we discuss the stem and leaf plots. These are just a few of the many, many, many ways to display and organize data.